Um, our speaker tonight <laughs> is Scott, Scott Sanderson, who's been a member of the group for a long time, um, knows a lot of stuff, he's going to tell us a bunch of stuff that he didn't used to know, but that now he knows, right? I know some. You know some, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm right in the good place for teaching where I know some, okay. but still remember what it's like to not know, I think. Okay, good. All right. So Scott. hopefully that works out for everybody. Take it away. All right. Cool. Yeah, so thanks everybody for coming out here. Can everybody in the back, can you hear me okay? All right, if at any point you can't hear me, raise a hand or wave me down or something, let me know and I will uh, speak up. Um, but yeah, and like uh, I thought it was sort of funny the way Ned mentioned, like it's great for us to have talks from beginners here. The very first public speaking I ever did um, was at Boston Python probably 11 years ago now. Um, since then, I've, I've given talks all over the place, but this has always sort of been my my home in the Python community and the development community. Um, it's really fun to be back. It's been a couple years since, since I've been here, or uh, been been here giving a talk. I've been uh, at, at events and whatnot. Um, and yeah, like like Ned said, like a lot of the best talks I think do come from folks who aren't super deep experts in subject matter because it's often hard if you're a really deep expert. It's hard for you to have that empathy for folks who don't know the thing that you know a whole lot about. And so this is a talk that's kind of born from my experience of going into a field that I didn't have a lot of experience of and over the last couple years have gotten some experience. And I think at that last social event, I was talking with Ned about it and I thought, oh, this might be a good opportunity to give a talk um, and maybe try to share some of that experience with everybody. So this is what I wish I had known before joining an authentication startup, a conceptual introduction to cryptography, which is a lot of syllables, and I apologize. Um, so who is this talk for? So this talk is basically for me circa 2019. So this is Scott on vacation in Peru, enjoying some tiny beers, very much oblivious to the, the couple years that were to come. Um, you know, enjoying things at the time. I was working at a, a Python startup called Quantopian that was building sort of online data science tooling, and a lot of my experience and knowledge and expertise was around sort of high performance data engineering tooling. And I had interacted a little bit with cryptographic stuff because we had a web platform and I had been a developer for long enough that I had like used an SSH key and copy pasted the commands from GitHub enough times to make a new SSH key. But every time I got a new laptop I had to go and recopy that same set of commands in order to do that. Um, and so I didn't have a lot of cryptographic experience. Um, and with that background, I decided to join a, uh, startup out of MIT um, that was founded by two uh, MIT cryptography PhDs to commercialize basically one of the founders PhD research. Um, and so I sort of went into this company with some very deep experts in a field that I did not have uh, a lot of expertise in. Um, and so this is what I looked like in January of 2021. Um, and part of that, I think, has to do with some of the sort of world events that took place between August 2019 and January of 2021. Um, but part of that also was, you know, a lot of learning. And, and I think I had to grow the requisite neck beard in order to uh, absorb the, the secrets of cryptography. So this is sort of me going back and trying to, you know, give some advice back to uh, young, naive, tiny beer Scott. Um, so outline for this talk, um, we're going to talk about cryptography. Um, I'm going to focus sort of on kind of the conceptual foundations of cryptography. So a lot of talks that I've seen that talk about cryptography tend to sort of give this very bottom up construction where you start from like very low level mathematical objects and you sort of build this towering hierarchy of things. And there's a whole bunch of abstraction and a whole bunch of details in between that sort of base level of mathematics and like the things that we actually interact with as a day-to-day -day as, as developers. And all of us, whether we're developers or we're just users of computers, are constantly interacting with, crypto with cryptography and cryptographic services, right? So these are things that are absolutely crucial to any you know, web-based system or network-based system or anything that does any kind of authentication, any, anything of that nature. Um, and so I, what I really, my goal for this talk is for people to come away with a sense of like, what are the things cryptography can do for us and what are the tools that we use to achieve those goals? And that's kind of what we're going to organize the talk around. Um, and so in particular, we're going to focus on kind of three 
fundamental goals or fundamental like capabilities that cryptography can help us get. Um, so the first one is integrity. So this is we have some data at you know some time in some place, and we're we you know we think it's the right data. It's it's the data that we want to have, and then we go away and maybe we send that data over a network or we just go away for a while over time and come back and we read it back off of a disk or out of somewhere else. And we want to be able to have confidence that the data has has not changed, hasn't been corrupted in some way, or it hasn't been changed in a way that we didn't expect or didn't want. Um, and cryptography can give us some tools for doing that. Um, another property that cryptography can give us that's important is authenticity. So uh, not just the data doesn't change, but also the data comes from where we think it's supposed to come to. So oftentimes we're working on services that are interacting with other people or other computers or other places, and they're claiming to be a certain person or they're claiming to have certain data, and we'd like to be able to have some kind of guarantee and ability to reason about whether that's the case. Um, so that's authenticity. Um, and then confidentiality is this property that uh, sometimes we'd like to store data or transmit data in a way that nobody else can read it. Like we have you know, sensitive banking information or we have like our private diary where we're like writing down all of our you know, high school crushes or whatever it is that we're, we're storing. But we have data that's very important to us that we don't want anyone else to be able to read. And we'd like to be able to use cryptography to ensure that only people we want to be able to read it uh, can do so. And notice that that's not quite the same thing as saying only we can read it. It's only people we want to be able to read it. So there's many cases where we'd like to be able to give you know specific sets of people. Like I'd like this website to be able to read my bank account, bank account information, but I would like you know the Russian botnet to not be able to do that. Um, so that's kind of the high level sort of organization of this talk is around those three capabilities. And then the other thing I really want to try to do is connect these capabilities to systems that we work with day to day in our, in our lives. So along the way, we're going to talk about some specific systems that uh, folks may, may or may not be familiar with. But even if you're not, you may be interacting with them without realizing it. So we're going to talk about um, JSON web tokens, which are a common way of storing authentication information in the browser. Uh, we're going to talk about a secure shell protocol and SSH, which is how most of us interact with sites like GitHub or if we run shell commands on remote servers. Uh, we'll talk about uh, FIDO2, which is the standard that's used for hardware uh, tokens, things like YubiKeys, or if you've heard sort of a bunch of commotion in the last six months to a year about passkeys, um, that's also based on the FIDO2 standard. Um, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about uh, transport layer security, which is the protocol that uh, over, that's used for basically all communication uh, between modern network services. And in particular, it's the thing that's happening every time you do like an HTTPS lookup in the browser. Um, so that's kind of our outline here. Um, so backing up for that for a second and just like abstractly when we talk about cryptography, what, what do we mean by that? Um, so the definition that I'm going to use for tonight, which is cobbled together from Wikipedia and NIST, uh, is cryptography is the use of computational and mathematical techniques to enable secure communication under adversarial conditions. And I've bolded uh, the two phrases, secure communication and adversarial conditions, because you might wonder, well, what, what does it mean to be secure, and what kinds of adversarial conditions are we looking to uh, overcome? Um, so usually... Uh, when we're talking about secure communication in cryptography, we're talking about sending data between two parties. And traditionally, the two parties are people whose names start with the letter A and start with the letter B. Um, so in this uh, example, I have uh, Albert, which is named after one of those cryptography PhDs, uh, and Bryn, who's sitting right in front of me here. Um, and they're trying to uh, share information over this complicated computer network here. And they'd like to be able to you know, send funny GIFs or bank account information or whatever kinds of information that's important to them back and forth over this network. Um, and they have very few guarantees from the network itself about what happens to their data when it goes on the network. They can put it on the network. Now we can say, hey, I'd like this message to go to Bryn. And the network will send it, and eventually some data will arrive at Bryn. But we don't know if uh, someone else has intercepted that data, maybe tampered with it, maybe read it. Um, you know, they can do, it's in plain text, they can do whatever we want. And so what we'd like to be able to do is somehow use math and computer science and fancy algorithms uh, to be able to 
build a way of securely communicating on top of this fundamentally insecure network. Yes? If you open the questions, I want to ask something. When Alice sends to Bob, yeah. like in your previous slide, you didn't have availability. Like, is data availability not a security parameter? So, uh, so there's a, a common acronym you'll see is CIA uh, in this, which is uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, it depends who you, like, I'm not claiming that the three things that I'm talking about are like canonical or like the, the perfect absolute definition. Um, availability, to my mind, is a little bit of an odd thing to include in cryptography generally. Um, there's certainly cases where, where it's important and your choice of cryptographic techniques can affect your availability, but we're not going to talk too much about that today. But that is sort of part of that classic triad, you're right. Um, yeah. So, anyway, so this is kind of one uh, scenario that we're interested in is we've got two parties whose names start with A and B, um, and they want to be able to send data back and forth securely over an insecure communication medium. Um, another example which is uh, very similar to this is uh, we are talking, in a sense we're still sending messages, but rather than sending them across the network, we're essentially sending them forward in time. We want to store data somewhere in a database. You know, so Albert shows up and he's sort of in this 1950s like madman salesman scenario. Um, and he puts data in his cylindrical database. And then at some point later, he comes back and he's a steampunk robot. And he would like to have some kinds of guarantees about what has happened to his data in the meantime, that no one has tampered with it um, or that no one has read it without his permission. Um, and a lot of the techniques that we use for uh, Transferring data securely also apply to the storage case, but it's useful to be able to have, sort of have those two cases distinct in your head is you know, sending data as well as uh, storing data for future selves. Um, and then we talked about adversarial conditions. So what kinds of adversaries are we interested in? Um, so here we've got uh, Albert and Bryn talking over this network, and uh, you guys can't quite see that, unfortunately. Let me see if I... Uh, her name is Evelyn down at the bottom, traditionally Eve, but uh, I've used Evelyn here. Uh, and Evelyn here is, a, is what we call a passive adversary. So a Evelyn is not uh, manipulating the messages back and forth, but she's sort of eavesdropping on these conversations and is listening to everything that's happening there. And, you know, we might want to be, Albert might be sending Bryn, you know, his famous peach cobbler recipe that he's going to use to beat Evelyn in, this, in the county fair. And it's very important to him that Evelyn not be able to uh, steal that information. And so we might care about how do we protect our, our communication from a passive adversary like Evelyn. Um, maybe even more challenging here is we might have an active adversary like Mao. So uh, in the previous slide, I'll note that... Uh, there's only one direction on the arrow going from the network to mouse. So she's only reading messages coming from the network. Um, but in the active adversary case, Mal is actually uh, actively sending messages back into the network as well. So Mal might be trying to impersonate Albert, for example, and intercepting the communication between Albert and Bryn in order to do various nefarious things. And we might also want to be secure uh, or at least aware that that's happening if, if Mal tries to do that to us. Um, so those are the scenarios we're going to talk about here. Um, traditionally, if you get deep into this stuff, there's a whole bunch of, uh, there's a whole sort of motley cast of characters if you read cryptography papers with fancy names like Eve and Aaron and Dan and Dave and Craig and Grace and Heidi and Even and Mallory. And I couldn't even fit them all on the slide. It actually keeps going all the way down to Wendy, I think. Um, so cryptographers like to give people uh, names in their papers, but we're going to focus on kind of these uh, scenarios. Um, and so the first kind of most fundamental capability that we're going to talk about here um, is data integrity. Um, so uh, before we even get to that scenario where we've got an adversary on the network, um, we might just be dealing with the fact that the network itself is chaotic and maybe unreliable. And we might be losing data in the process of sending. So, you know, these wires are going all over the place. They cross each other. Data gets dropped. It gets lost. Servers, you know, go out of commission. Um, lots of bad things can happen, and we might want to try to ensure or at least be able to detect when bad things happen to our data when it's transferring over the network. Um, similarly, we talked about the case where Albert is trying to store data in his database here, um, and it might turn out that that database is actually a trash can fire. Um, and we might want to try to protect ourselves from the flames of the trash can consuming our data, uh, even, even in the face of, of that scenario. 
Um, and so the first example we're going to talk about here is uh, we've got a client and a server, and they're going to try to communicate, um, but their communication is intermediated by a, by a buggy router. And we want to see if we can detect when the router has manipulated the data. Um, can folks read that okay, or do I need to make this a little bigger? Okay. Um, cool. So... So we've got a whole bunch of examples here. So the first scenario we're going to talk about here is just we've got a client and a server who are uh, going to exchange some messages back and forth. Um, still, still legible for everybody? Cool. Um, so here I've got uh, two programs here. I've got a basic client and a basic server. And all they're going to do is the server is going to sit and run forever on port uh, 5555. And it's going to accept incoming socket connections. It's going to read messages from the socket. And it's just going to print the messages to the terminal. Um, and then uh, the basic client is going to connect to the server. Um, it's going to uh, send a message saying hello from Bryn. Um, and then it's going to exit. And so if I come over here and I say python m example.basic server. Uh, Examples, excuse me. There we go. So the server is running. It's listening uh, for messages on port 5555. Oops. And now if I come down here and I say basic client, I'm going to tell it to connect to port 5555. Then it's going to send hello from Bryn, and my server is going to receive that message and say got message, hello from Bryn. So in this scenario, we were successfully able to transfer, transmit a message over the network. Nothing bad happened to our data. We're happy. Um, but suppose you know, our network gets reconfigured, and now we're no longer directly talking from our client to our server. And instead, we've got a buggy router in between them. So I'm going to start another terminal here. And I am going to run a new program, which is a buggy router. And the buggy router is going to sit and it's going to listen for messages on port 5556. Uh, it's going to read the messages and then it's going to helpfully try to fix some typos in the messages. So it sees the name Bryn and it goes, oh, that's a typo. That should be Brian. Um, and it's going to try to rewrite Bryn to Brian and then it's going to forward it through to the server. Um, and unfortunately, because there's no kind of integrity protection in our message, uh, our client won't be able to tell and our server won't be able to tell that our message has been tampered with and that our data has been irreversibly corrupted by being rewritten in this way. So we're going to run buggy router and now the buggy router is sitting and it's listening for messages on port 5556 and it's going to forward them with this data corruption applied to port 5555. Um, so now I'm going to run the basic client but instead of connecting to sending the message to 5555, the original server, I'm going to send it to 5556. And when that happens, we can see that, tragically, even though we sent hello from Bryn, we received hello from Brian. So this is the scenario that we'd like to be able to protect against. So how can we ensure data integrity in the face of unreliable transit and storage media? Um, and one very simple answer is to use a technique called cryptographic hashing. And the basic idea of a cryptographic hash is that a cryptographic hash takes an arbitrary length input um, and it returns a short, usually fixed length. So for a given hashing algorithm, it says I always spit out 16 bytes or 32 bytes or 24 bytes or whatever. Um, it's just a short sort of summary of the data. Um, and in particular, there's a couple of important properties of the summary. So the hat, given a piece of data, so given the same string or the same message, uh, Taking a hash of that message always produces exactly the same output. Um, and if I have two different pieces of data that are different in any way, so if I have the same, same message and I alter even one byte of it, uh, then those pieces of data have negligible property of having the same hash. And in fact, we should expect that if I change even a single bit, um, that roughly 50% of the bits in the hash will flip. So essentially, the output of the hash is totally uncorrelated with the bits of the input. Um, and effectively, what that means is that if I know the hash of an input, that doesn't reveal any information to me 
or sorry, yeah, if I know the hash, then it doesn't reveal to me any information about the original input. Um, so we can sort of think of a hash function schematically like this. So we have some data, we feed it into the hash function, and the hash function is asymmetric. So uh, the data goes in, we get a hash function, we get out the hash of the data, um, and we can't go the other way. We can only sort of go in one direction through this data flow graph. Um, and if I have two different pieces of data and I feed them into the hash function, I get out two different hashes. And for any two pieces of data, I have extremely low probability that feeding them into the hash will result in the same uh, output. Um, and what this means is that we can use cryptographic hashes as a way of uh, giving ourselves some, some weak but useful guarantees about what happens to our data. So instead of just sending our data with no other kind of information, we can send the data and the hash of the data. And then if the data gets modified or the hash gets modified, then when we try to come back, we can recompute the hash and see if they match. And if they don't match, then we know that something has changed. Either the data has changed or the hash has changed. And either way, somehow our message has been corrupted in transit or it's been corrupted sitting in our trash can database. Um, and so I'm gonna close my server here. Uh, I'm actually going to keep the buggy router running, and I'm going to open up a slightly modified version of our server. So instead of the basic server, we're going to have a hash server. And the only difference between this server, oops, the only difference between this uh, server and the previous server is that our server is gonna expect that the first 32 bytes of the message is the hash of the rest of the message. And it's gonna use that to verify the integrity of the rest of the message. And so that means that the server and the client now need to, now need to coordinate when they send these messages back and forth. They, they have to agree in advance on a protocol to say, okay, hey, whenever you send me a message, you have to put the hash of that message in the first 32 bytes of the data that you send me. Uh, so, and the hash client is gonna do the same thing. So instead of just sending the message directly, which is what we used to do, now we call this send hashed message function. And we're going to use the Python standard library. It actually comes with a module for uh, doing these kinds of hashes. It's called hashlib. And the hash that we're gonna use for this is SHA-256, which stands for secure hashing algorithm. Um, there have been a whole bunch of iterations of the secure hashing algorithm. So the numbering is a little bit confusing. They, they, people like to say that there's only two hard problems in computer science, which is uh, cache and validation and naming things. Um, cryptographers solve a whole bunch of other hard problems, and so they sometimes punt on the naming things piece. So we have SHA-1 and then SHA-2, which includes SHA-256 and I think like SHA-380 something and SHA-512. And then we went back down to SHA-3, which is the most recent one. Um, but SHA-256 is uh, very commonly used. It's the thing that uh, Bitcoin uses for hashing the blockchain, and it's used uh, very widely, and it's still considered a secure um, hashing function. Um, and it comes just right in the standard library, so it's convenient to use. Um, so I'm going to run my, uh, instead of running the basic server, I'm going to run the hash server. Oops. And the buggy router is still running, so it's still gonna, the buggy router doesn't know anything about this. It's just blindly forwarding messages. It's not gonna modify the hash or in any way interact with it, but it's just gonna pass through the data unchanged. It's still gonna try to replace any time it sees Bryn with Brian. Um, so now if I send my hash client and I point it back at port 5555, then we should expect that everything should work because our messages aren't being intercepted by the buggy router and our hashes should verify and everything should be great. And indeed, we see that they do. So now our new hash server says, I got message, hello from Bryn, and this was the hash. Um, and I slightly actually glossed over this, but the other thing that the server is gonna do is when it receives the message in the hash, it's gonna pull out those first 32 bytes and say, okay, this is the hash that the client sent me. This is the rest of the message. It's gonna compute its own copy of the hash and then it's gonna check and say, does the hash that I computed match the one that the client sent to me? And that's how we're gonna know if our data got corrupted in transit. Um, and so we can see that in this instance, as expected, our data wasn't intercepted, it wasn't modified, and so it got, uh, yes? 
uh, like, oh, in the variable names? Uh, that's because hash is a Python built-in, and my text editor syntax highlighting complains at me when I use it as a variable name, and I am a slave to the syntax highlighting. Um, yes, that is there. I, you 100% you could use it as a local variable, and it's fine, because the hash built-in is very rarely used. Um, so anyway, so that works. Um, so now... I'm going to run the client again, but this time I'm going to point at the buggy router, and the buggy router we should expect is going to intercept our message, modify it, and hopefully our hash-based protocol is going to detect that modification. Um, and indeed, we see that it did. So instead, we got message here, and here was the hash, and we're loudly explaining that the hashes did not match. Um, so our, our protocol worked, and we're now able to detect any time Brin gets rewritten to Brian. Um, so cryptographic hashes get used all over the place. Um, I mentioned earlier, so uh, Git uses that original SHA-1 ha um, hash to identify commits. So anytime you do like git commit and you see that long weird string of like uh, numbers and letters, um, that's the SHA-1 of the Git object in the Git database. Um, Git has actually been since about 2018, been in the progress of migrating away from SHA-1 because it was found to be uh, potentially vulnerable to collisions. So people figured out a way to create two git commits that uh, actually have that bad property that you have two different commits that hash to the same values and that breaks some of the properties that git uses to, to function. Um, so theoretically, git has, is in the process of migrating to SHA-256, although as far as I know, that progress has kind of stalled for a while and I, I don't think folks are super actively working about it. Um, and then I also mentioned Bitcoin uses SSJ-256 as a way of sort of linking together the blocks in the blockchain. And that's part of how it guarantees data integrity. Um, so to summarize cryptographic hashing, um, uh, cryptographic hashes are a way for us to, let me, I'll finish here and then I'll take questions for the section. Uh, cryptographic hashes give us uh, a cheap way to compute a short summary of an input. Um, learning the hash of a value doesn't reveal any information uh, for us, or doesn't give us any information about that value. Um, hashes are good primarily for protecting against accidental data corruption. So uh, in particular, one thing that hashes do not protect us from is uh, malicious data tampering. So in this case, the buggy router, router wasn't trying to be malicious. It wasn't like doing the worst possible thing it could to us. It was just kind of silently modifying the data. Um, and so because of that, we were able to detect that. But a malicious router who was trying to actively circumvent our protocol um, could, in fact, uh, get around that by recomputing the hash itself because everything that goes into the hash is public information. And so if the router knew our data integrity protocol, um, it could compute, it could modify the data and then compute the hash of that modified data and include that in its message downstream, and then we would no longer be able to detect that modification. Um, and so in general, cryptographic hashes by themselves are not a good tool for guaranteeing data integrity in the presence of a malicious uh, party. Um, and then I'm, I'm not going to talk about this too much here, but I do want to briefly mention um, people talk about storing passwords and password hashing. Um, the kinds of hashes that you should use for um, storing passwords. First of all, if you're writing a website and you're storing passwords, you should probably just be using whatever your web framework du jour provides for that. Um, but in particular, you should not be using the kinds of hashes that we're talking about here um, because these kinds of hashes are designed to run extremely quickly and they can be run extremely, extremely efficiently on uh, GPUs and, and custom hardware. And so they're very, very easy to brute force. Um, and so we actually have special kinds of uh, hash functions that are used for storing passwords that we call, we somewhat confusingly called key derivation functions sometimes because there's other things that are also called key derivation functions that are different and also shouldn't be used for passwords. Uh, but they're also, I think, a more a better and more precise name is also key stretching functions. Um, in general, you really just shouldn't be rolling your own password storage and pretty much every web framework that is worth using has a solution for this. So uh, I just wanted to mention that, but I didn't, I'm not talking about it too much. Um, any questions before we move on from hashing? Yeah. The uh, 256, is that the length of the hash? Uh, yes, that's the length of the digest that comes out. So it's 32 bytes or 256 uh, bits. It's, yeah, it's in bits. And sometimes it's in bits and sometimes it's in bytes, which is also confusing. Yeah. Uh, what guarantee do we have that 
it's not possible to reverse engineer the algorithm. <clears throat> Uh, when you say reverse engineer, like that it's not possible to go from the hash of a value back to the original value. Um, I am not a deep expert on sort of the mathematics of that. My general understanding is that we don't have like bulletproof mathematical proofs of that. It's more of a, we have pretty good heuristic evidence that it's not uh, reversible and we don't have any good ideas about how to reverse it. But for example, if you look through like the list of history of various hashing functions, like that SHA1 function, that used to be considered secure and people thought that was collision resistant and then it turned out not to be. And some of that has to do with like hardware getting better over time and we've just gotten, we're processing more data and we can process stuff faster. Um, and some of that is our algorithms are getting better over time. So SHA256 has held up for quite a while. I'm not super up on the history, but uh, it's a good question, and I think the answer is we have good heuristic evidence, but not sort of ironclad mathematical rigorous proof. If, if the question was about going from the hash back to the original value, then yeah. the hash has fewer bits than the possible messages yes. that could have gone in, so it, it can't possibly be reversed. The hash has fewer, fewer bits. bits. There are more. Yeah, you, so you could reverse it to some equivalence class of things. So you could find something that hashes to the same right. thing. Right. It doesn't necessarily give in, yeah. So Ned, Ned's point is we might not be able to get, because there's infinitely many possible strings and only finitely many hashes of a given value. So there's infinitely many collisions in the abstract for any given hash value, but most of them are longer than the number of atoms in the universe because in an infinite space, most things are longer than the number of atom, atoms in the universe. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned that... Uh, uh, sort of hashes and do not protect malicious tampering. Uh, that means a hacker is has access, local access to a computer and locally modifying the application data during the runtime, right? Uh, before it's hashed. That's, is that what you mean by simply uh, modifying the data? No, so, so the malicious adversary I'm imagining here is something like a man in the middle attack where I think, you know, Alice thinks, or uh, Albert thinks he's talking to Bryn but there's actually someone in the middle intercepting that traffic and modifying it. Intercepting it in her computer, though? Not, uh, not could, the, could just be on the network there. I mean, it depends on, the, yeah, it depends on the network well, substrate. That, that is, is unhashed, yes, so before, before it's so the So what's happening in, in that scenario is uh, Albert has a message. He takes that message, prepends the hash, sends that over the network. That message gets intercepted. Right, and the adversary knows that this is the protocol, and so they can peel off the hash, modify the message, append the append a new hash that's correct for the modified message, and then forward that through. But if data from Alice is coming out as hashed already, yeah, like, like encrypted, yeah, no, it's not. Encrypted. Well, so yeah, so no, it's, it's not encrypted. Data yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just talking about hashing. So all hash. all this is is a, is a checksum alongside the so, the data. So I guess my question is. Uh, is is it possible to hash the, uh, the actual application locally? Uh, to, maintain, to maintain the integrity of the application. Like, let's say you have a Hello World application and you want to hash the actual executive. Something needs, you, you need the actual application to be able to run, right? So, like, something somewhere has the bytes. Unless you've got a Python interpreter that magically runs on hashed data, I don't, I don't know how that's going to happen. I, I think the confusion is the. the, the we're not talking about encrypting. Right, there's no confusion. I get confused that. Yeah. 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 It's just it's plain yes. Yeah. Yes, this is sort of the, the simplest and weakest thing we can do. And we're going we're gonna to build up to progressively stronger things that we can do with our data. So learning, learning, the, excuse me, learning the hash value of a value can tell you something about the value if, if there's a message that repeats. Uh, yes, yes. So, and it can also tell you things like if, if you just have a big pile of values. Basically, the best thing you can do if you learn a hash of a value is try running a whole bunch of other values that you've either seen before or just you know in advance and see if I hash any of them, do they match the value that I've seen there? And that's why we don't use these kinds of functions for passwords because there's things called dictionary attacks where basically someone will say, I will try to hash all of the passwords that anyone ever uses and see if any of them match the hash that's stored in my database. And that's actually pretty feasible. I'll do one more and then I, I do want to move on. 
Um, I've heard about like salting passwords. Yes. Yeah. That different from key, key scratch. Key scratching, or is that like involved? It's usually it's part of that process usually, and and the basic goal of doing that is most people's passwords have what cryptographers would say is low entropy. So in the abstract, if everyone if everyone's password were a uniformly randomly drawn 64-bit number, salting wouldn't really help anything. But in practice, people use passwords like password and like A, B, C, D, E, F. And so hackers will do things like see if any of the passwords in the database hash to match password. And so one of the things that we do is we add extra random data to the hash to the passwords that we store uh, before hashing them. And we use that as a way to make it harder for uh, folks to do that. Um, we can talk more about password hashing stuff later, though again, really it's just a thing where you should be using whatever your, your library is for. I'll, I'll do one more and then, yeah. I, as far as I know, quantum computers are not actively being used for anything, but I am very much not an expert of that on that. Uh, I think people are actively researching it, and there is like there's a whole field of post quantum cryptography that is way above my pay grade. Um, but people do worry about like what kinds of algorithms will be worse in a world where quantum computers are actually useful for things. Um, I do not know anything about that. Cool. Um, so to quote a famous author from the previous slide, uh, we, talk, we said that cryptographic hashes usually do not protect us from malicious tampering because an adversary can simply modify the data and recompute the hash uh, from, from some person a few minutes ago. Um, and sort of morally, the reason that that is the case is that hashing only uses public data, right? We didn't use anything that was secret or not known to an attacker to try to guarantee our data integrity. And so anything that we can do with hashing, the attacker can emulate. Um, and so what that should suggest is that in order to defeat a malicious adversary, we need to somehow incorporate a secret value that's known only to us. Um, and this, probably the simplest way to do that is, is with something called a message authentication code or a MAC. Um, and there's lots of different kinds of Macs, but the kind that you're most likely to run into and the kind that's easiest to use um, is called a hash-based message authentication code. Um, and as it may sound, a hash-based message, message authentication code builds on top of the cryptographic hashes that we just talked about. And essentially, it cleverly mixes in a secret value into the data to take advantage of that property that we talked about, which is that if we change any part of the data, then uh, it completely scrambles the, the output of, of the hashing function. Um, and we actually have to be fairly careful about this. You, like, you might naively think like, oh, I'm just gonna like, prepend a secret to my data and then hash that. And it turns out there's actually attacks that break that that I don't understand well enough to talk about here. But uh, as sort of practitioners using this kind of stuff for the most part, uh, all you need to know is you should probably just use HMAC. Um, and it, it sort of, it's only slightly more complicated than what I just said, but the details there matter. Um, and uses the key twice instead of once. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna pull back over to my servers here, um, and we're gonna show one more example, but this time instead of, append, uh, instead of prepending the hash, we're gonna do almost exactly the same thing, except instead of using the hash, we're gonna prepend uh, an HMAC. So now instead of hash server, I've got HMAC server. Um, and this function should look very similar to the previous one. So this used to say hashed, and now instead it says hmacked. And instead of using hashlib.sha256, I'm now using the standard library hmac module. So this also comes as one of Python's many included batteries. Um, and uh, in order to compute the max, so we're going to do the same thing on the server. Our connection is going to come in. Um, and because the output of our Mac function here is ultimately just a SHA-256, it's just a SHA-256 on data that's been slightly clever, cleverly scrambled up with our secret value. So the data is still going to be 32 bytes coming back out. So we're going to pull off those first 32 bytes from the Mac message. Um, we're going to pull off the rest of the data. And then we're going to use hmac.new with a secret key. So this is kind of the, the most important bit here is, whereas previously we were just using the hash, 
Now our read HMAC message includes a key, which is the MAC key. And that's the thing that the adversary doesn't know because it's a secret value. Um, and so we're going to use that to compute the MAC. And then we're going to use HMAC.CompareDigest to compare the sent HMAC with the HMAC that we computed uh, from the message ourselves. And then on the client, we're going to do something very similar. So our send HMAC message is just going to do the same uh, HMAC.new of message. Um, oh, and this does not actually have a name. I get for editing my examples at the last minute. Uh, there we go. Cool. So now this program, whereas before it didn't take any inputs, we just used the hash. Now we're going to pass a command line argument uh, to our program, which is uh, the HMAC key. So we're going to run HMAC server and We're going to generate a random secret using the standard library secrets module, which is yet another one of those built-in batteries. So we're going to run the HMAC server. We're going to pass it the secret value. And now the HMAC server is once again running. It's listening for messages. Um, and we've, got, we've still got our buggy router in the middle here, still none the wiser. Um, and now we're going to run our HMAC client. An important aspect of this is I'm going to pass the HMAC client that same secret. So the kind of cost that we're paying here is now, whereas previously in order to do a hash-based sort of agreement protocol, we didn't have to have any shared secrets. We didn't have to have any state or anything to manage. Now we have a secret that's shared between the server and the client. And you know that comes with extra complexity in management. We, we could lose that secret. We could leak that secret. Many things, bad things could happen, bad could happen to that secret. But secrecy is sort of the price we pay for being able to defeat the malicious adversary here. Um, bytes like object is required, not HMAC. What did I get wrong? HMAC.new. Oh, I think I need. <laughs> I think I need dot digest on. I'm going to just live check this real quick. Cool. Okay. That's what we needed. So I forgot to add digest on the end of those. So I'm going to try this one more time. Oops. All right, server's running on the top one, man in the middle still running down there. Cool. And message did not match. Missing required argument. Oh, I didn't pass the key. I think I just did not run this example, and I apologize for that. Okay, there we go. We successfully got our uh, Mac message through. And now if I try to do the same thing, that I connect to the client and our message gets tampered with, then we get maxed and not matched. So that's what we're hoping for. And this time, and again, this kind of comes back to the question earlier, uh, I can't prove to you that there's no uh, way for an adversary to, uh, to defeat this construction. But as far as I know, the best cryptographers in the world can't prove to you that they can't. And this is what roughly all communication that we use is built on top of. So there's some reasonably strong sort of practical proof, if not mathematical proof, that it's very hard for us to break this construction. Um, so examples of Max as they're used in the wild. So I mentioned um, pretty much all symmetric encryption systems, which is what we're going to talk about uh, after the break, uh, use a Mac for authentication. Um, 
Another thing that's very common is how, how many folks here have interacted with or have heard of JSON web tokens or JWTs? Cool. So maybe half to a quarter of the folks. So JSON web tokens are a pretty common standard. Oh no, I had internet before, oh well. Um, there's a neat site here, jwt.io, that you can look at that shows you what these look like. They're basically just a clever way of storing uh, J to like authentication tokens in JSON. Um, and they have a pluggable, and the way that they're authenticated, usually what they're used for is I log into a server with a password or with some other mechanism, and that server wants to issue me a token that, exp that sort of reflects the fact that I've logged into the server, and that gets stored in a cookie or in a session or in some kind of persistent state. And a very common format that those tokens are used for, uh, or are stored in, is JWT. And the way that those tokens are verified is that the server, when it issues the token, uh, includes an HMAC of the token using a secret that only it knows. Um, and then when you come back, you're, you've, you know, you've logged in, you go away from the site for a while, you come back, that data gets sent down in the cookie again. The server still has that same secret, but you as the, as the client never had that secret, so you can't forge a token yourself. And the server can use that MAC key in order to verify uh, that the token it came from it. So this is an example of the case where we talked about earlier where, where it's not so much us talking to somebody else, but it's us talking to future us, but we're storing the data in kind of a malicious context like our logged in user's browser. And we'd like to be able to store that data in the user's browser in a way that they can't tamper with it or forge a token for us. And we still wanna be able to uh, verify it in the future. All right, so Ned, I know you mentioned uh, maybe wanting to do an intermission here. How are we doing on time? Seven okay. Yep. Um, in the example that, that you gave, you generated yep. a, a key code with yep. random secrets. Yep. Um, does it have to be something like that, or can I just use you know, my favorite three colors? Uh, it is important that it's that it's high entropy. It's the the Mac is only going to be as secure as the key you put in because if someone can guess the Mac, then they can break the Mac. And so, you want it to be something that is hard to guess. And it's generally not something that as a human you're going to type in. It's going to be something that comes in in a config file or from like a vault service or something like that. And so you generally you want it to basically be a uniformly random chosen value of bytes of whatever the length of the Mac that you're using. Yeah. You showed an example where the client and the server were using an identical key and you copy pasted it between your two programs. Yes. How do people typically communicate that key between the client and the server or is that hard to? Uh, so that is, yes, that is one of the hard problems. So the, I would say the most common way that Mac keys are communicated is they are the same person. It's, it's most commonly used for that scenario like issuing a token where I, I, as the server, have a Mac key. I issue a token that gets stored somewhere I don't control and I want to be able to verify it when it comes back. But you could also use that, for example, like if you just have two services running in your cluster or whatever and you can control the configuration for both of them, you could just give them the same token there. Um, but yes, you're, so very much foreshadowing, though, the next section, which is, what do we do if we don't if we can't easily do that? How do we bootstrap shared secrets if we don't have that kind of trust relationship with our components? All right, let's do like a five minute break and then don't forget to thank the sponsor. <laughs> uh, see you back here in five minutes. That gives me time to think how I close the window of our Good to, to get, get rolling again? Yeah, yeah, let's go. All right, cool. All right, um, I'll apologize in advance if we go a little fast through this last section here. I'm about halfway through the talk and about 80% through the time. So uh, definitely, I'm probably not going to stop for questions, but feel free to, to grab me afterwards if you have questions. Um, and I apologize if we go a little fast through this last section here. Um, but so just to summarize what we just talked about before the break, we were talking about message authentication codes. Um, Macs are conceptually very similar to hashes. They're basically the, like, the, the simplest possible thing you could do on top of hashes to make them resistant to an adversary. Um, and morally, they're essentially a clever way of mixing a secret value into a hash in a way that makes it hard for an adversary to um, protect. 
They're usually, they're often built from cryptographic hashes. And in particular, the kind that you're most likely to run into is there's sort of a family of Macs called HMAC dash hash name. Um, so given for, for any cryptographically secure hash function, there is an associated HMAC, which is built on top of that hash function. They all use the same construction, just with different hash. So there's HMAC SHA-1 and SHA-2 and SHA-3 and SHA various numbers. Um, so now I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. So far, we've, we had kind of been talking about those two scenarios where either um, Albert is sending a message to Bryn, or maybe Albert is sending a message to future Bryn, or to, to future Albert, either through a database, or maybe we talked about cases where it gets mediated by a browser. Um, and one of the things we got sort of a prescient question about is uh, how do we deal with distributing that shared secret between uh, those two parties? And in the case where you know it's Albert and future Albert, that's pretty easy. In a case where it's Albert and Bryn and they have some pre-established trust relationship, maybe it's also pretty easy. Um, but what about a scenario where we have lots of different users all connecting to the same system who maybe don't have a mutual trust relationship? Or maybe even if they do have a mutual trust relationship, maybe we don't want to have a single shared secret that's shared between all of them because like we're a big company and like employees leave and come all the time and we don't want to have to change everyone's password every time a new employee gets hired or leave, things like that. Um, so we'd like to have a way of getting some of the properties that we just talked about um, without having to have a single shared secret that's shared with everyone who interacts with our system. Um, so we're sort of imagining here, we've got all these different kind of 1950s cartoon characters. And they're, maybe they're all connecting to a mainframe, like this is the SSH server where they're running their 1950s deep learning AI jobs at like two, you know, decahertz. Um, um, so this is our question, right? How can we guarantee integrity and authenticity among, you know, maybe a large group of people where shared secrets are impractical? Um, and one useful tool for we, we have for that is digital signatures, which are a form of asymmetric cryptography um, that provides similar guarantees as a Mac, but without needing shared secrets. Um, so with asymmetric cryptography, we're no longer using a single shared secret. So with a Mac, we computed the Mac, we used a secret, and then we used the same Mac, or same secret to verify the Mac. Um, with asymmetric cryptography and with digital signatures, we're going to split that secret into two pieces, and it's going to have a public component and a private component. We're generally going to call this the public key and the private key. Um, and we, we're able to do different things with those two components. So there's two fundamental operations involved in digital signatures. There's signing and there's verifying. And signing is an operation that we do with the private key and some data. So we take our key, we take our data, we sign the data, and what we get back out is a signature. Um, very importantly, signing data does not protect, does not provide confidentiality. Nothing we've talked about today so far provides confidentiality. And a common misconception is that signatures somehow prevent people from reading your data. Um, I have worked on systems that had production bugs where people stored things like JWTs and didn't realize that those were effectively in plain text. That no one can tamper with them, but anybody can read them. Um, so all it gives us is the ability to have, we have our data and now we have this extra piece of, the, of data alongside it, which is the signature of that data under the particular private key that we used. And then the second operation that we get with digital signatures is verification. So in the previous slide, we had, we had a key, we have data, we sign, we get signature out as this sort of weird hexagony shape. Um, and then we take that signature later, the data, and now we can use the public key and we can verify that data. We can verify that data with respect to the signature. And what we get back out is just a yes or no, um, indicating whether the data is the same as what was signed by the private key. So essentially, if, we have, if we're able to verify a signature on a piece of data using a public key, then what that guarantees for us is that that signature was produced on the exact same piece of data with the private key, by the private key that corresponds to the public key. Um, so one way you can think about it is like the, the private key sort of puts the data in, or it puts a special stamp, or I mean literally the metaphor is it signs the data, like it writes on it with a pen, and the public key has the ability to sort of verify that that pen is actually authentic and that it was written on the official paper 
so to speak. So it guarantees both that the data hasn't been tampered with and that the signature came from the private key associated with the data. Um, and so with this capability, we can solve our problem for sort of a modest number of users as follows. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to take all of our users and we're going to uh, give them all public private key pairs. They're all going to go to GitHub and copy paste that one section that everyone's done when they set up a GitHub account. Um, and they're going to run SSH key gen, and then they're going to be confused when a weird ASCII art picture comes out. Um, but we're going to get all of their, we're going to distribute to them private keys, and a private key is going to come with a public key as well. Um, we're going to store the private keys on the user's machines. Uh, and this actually should say public keys, I apologize. So we're going to distribute the user's public keys to the server. We're going to store the private keys on the user's machines. Very important, this should say public. Um, um, and then one mechanism that we, there's various things we can do to authenticate our users, but one fairly common one is what's called sort of a, a challenge response protocol. So a user is going to show up and say, hey, I'd like to be authenticated to this server, and they're going to present their public key, and the server is going to look at the list of public keys that were distributed to it in this bullet that was mistyped. So we've distributed all those public keys, and you know, Albert shows up and says, hey, I'm Albert. The server says, yes, I have Albert's public key. And the server is going to generate a random string, send it to Albert and say, prove to me that you are Albert by signing this random string using your private key. And then I will verify that signature using the public key that I have uh, stored locally. Um, so this is kind of what our diagram is going to end up looking like. So we have all these users who now have their uh, public or have their private keys stored locally and we've added a file cabinet to our server that has all of the public keys um, this this is uh, for an SSH server this is the authorized keys file here if you've ever administrated uh, like an EC2 instance that people were allowed to uh, SSH to so it's literally just a plain text file and it's it's a useful thing that the public keys we don't have to treat as especially sensitive for the most part. They are designed to be public. So it's just, we have a big list of essentially, here are all the names of the people who are allowed to authenticate. We still have to be careful about what keys get put in that list because it is effectively the list of who is allowed to authenticate, but the keys themselves are, or the public keys themselves are not secret. Um, and then we can run a protocol that looks like this. So if, if uh, folks haven't seen this style of diagram before, this is called a sequence flow diagram. And the way that you read this is, uh, one column here is a person or is an entity interacting usually over a network sending messages back and forth and the other column is another person. So in this example, Albert shows up and says to the server, hello, I'm Albert, um, usually by presenting their public key to the server. Um, the server generates a random string like LOL so random and says, Albert, please sign this random string that I have generated for you. Uh, Albert uses his uh, private key to sign that string and sends back the signature of uh, LOL so random under my key is John Hancock. Uh, in practice, it's going to be an arbitrary string of bytes, but it's a slide. Um, and then the server is going to verify that signature using the pre-registered public key. And if that signature verifies, then access will be granted to Albert. Uh, and we should immediately have questions about what it means to access, to grant access, because we still don't have a mechanism for communicating securely. Um, but that's sort of digital signatures. And so that one common way that these get used is, is for, authenticate, for authenticating, but we can also use them the exact same way we used Max uh, in the previous example. So I might just have some data, and I might want to send it to someone else in a way that they have a strong you know, level of confidence that that data came, both came from me and is the data that I sent them. And I can sign that data with my uh, private key and somehow transmit my public key to them. And again, you should have questions about what it means and how that happens. Um, but somehow I will get my public key to them in a way that that happens. Um, and then they can use that public key to verify the data that I have signed. Um, so digital signatures are all over the place in the wild. Um, as I mentioned, this, the scheme that we just sort of constructed here is more or less what happens when you do SSH authentication. Um, uh, other things that you get that gets used for is this challenge response cycle is essentially what happens when you do a FIDO authentication. So if you plug a YubiKey uh, into your uh, keyboard and you log into whatever service, uh, what happens there is the service 
is, is pushing a random string to the YubiKey, and there's a cryptographic private key and hardware on the YubiKey, it signs that data and sends back the, the signature. And uh, that's, that's how that gets verified. Um, this is also what uh, pass keys are, if, if folks have heard about pass keys. Pass keys are essentially an outgrowth of that, uh, that FIDO model, and pretty much all of the major like uh, phone and operating system providers are pushing towards uh, pass keys because they're good in some ways. They're this controversial thing. They're, they're more secure, but maybe less good for sort of user data sovereignty. Um, this is also just like how most like authentication happens on uh, networks. So this is this is what happens when you like verify a certificate in the browser. There's other things that happen there because you have to. That gets into the problem of like how do I decide which keys I want to trust and which public keys are are valid. But digital signatures are heavily involved in in all of those things. Um, so yeah, so summarizing this section, digital signatures are similar to Max, but instead of using a single symmetric key that's shared between all the parties, uh, we're going to use an asymmetric key pair instead of a shared Mac key. Um, public keys can be shared freely. Um, only the private keys need to be kept secret. Um, data signed with the private key can be verified with the public key. Um, and besides data integrity, they're super useful for authentication. Um, I'm going to keep moving in just in the interest of time because we've got five minutes left, but I'm happy to chat with folks after. And I also, I have a bunch of Python examples of doing this that I'm going to skip over in the interest of time. Um, but the, the two libraries you should look at for doing this are the cryptography library um, and Pinacle, which is bindings to Libsodium. They're both, uh, Libsodium is sort of a nicer, friendlier API, but it makes some kind of idios some idiosyncratic choices that, like, unless you're only using Pinacle and Libsodium, you might not have the best interoperability with other systems. Cryptography is a little more scary if you're outside of its kind of recipes section, but it's much more standards focused and it's more likely to interoperate with other systems. That's kind of the one high level takeaway. Um, so I mentioned in the previous section, we haven't done anything in, in this talk so far to give us uh, confidentiality, right? So back at the very start of this talk, we talked about the scenario where Albert is talking to Bryn over this insecure communication, and Evelyn is eavesdropping on their communication, trying to steal Albert's famous peach cobbler recipe. Um, and all of the techniques we talked about, hashing and digital signatures and Max, all of those are about guaranteeing integrity of messages. They don't do anything for preventing people from reading our messages. Like when we send a Mac or we send a signature, we always have to send the message as well for someone to be able to actually do anything with that. And so it doesn't give us any, anything useful by itself for confidentiality. Um, uh, however, cryptography has tools for providing confidentiality. Um, this is probably the thing that you sort of think of first, actually, when you think of cryptography, if I had to guess. I think it's what most people think of, which is uh, we have encryption. And the, most, the simplest form of encryption that we can have is what we call symmetric encryption. And this sort of is back to uh, a scenario that was more like what we were talking about with Max, where we have a single key that's used for both encryption and decryption. So we can take our data, take a key, feed it through an encryption function, and what we get back out is what we call ciphertext. And ciphertext is kind of similar to a hash in that it sort of doesn't reveal any information about the original message, um, except it's no longer sort of fixed short length. It's gonna be at least as long as the message and probably a bit longer. Um, but it allows us to transmit data in a way that is scrambled that no one who doesn't have the decryption key, which is also the encryption key, can understand. Um, so then later on, at some point later, after we've sent a message or after we've come back to our database, um, we can take the ciphertext, we can take the key, we can feed it through a decryption function, and what we get back out is our original data. Um, I'm going to like super quickly just show you what this looks like. These are actually... This is kind of the simplest thing for most of these libraries, uh, although the naming is a little bit. So in cryptography, their sort of preferred thing for doing this is called Fernet, um, which is kind of an odd name. But with Fernet, you say cryptography.fernet, or import Fernet. Uh, they have a utility for generating a key, but generally in a production system, this is going to be a key that's persisted and long-lived. Um, but we construct a Fernet, and then we can do f.encrypt my data, we're going to get out some, some sort of jarbled gibberish. Um, and then if we decrypt the data, we get something back. So if I do um, So the ciphertext is kind of 
indecipherable stuff, but the plain text comes back out. Um, there's similar stuff for uh, Knackle. Knackle calls this box. So you put stuff in a box and then you take stuff out of a box. Uh, Knackle's stuff is sort of a little bit like friendlier and more evocative in a way. Um, but again, doesn't interoperate as well with uh, other systems. Um, so that's what those look like. I'll, I'll post these slides up in the, uh, if folks want to show up in the Boston Python Discord, uh, we'll have slides with a whole bunch of examples here. Oh, sorry, not Discord, Slack. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so last thing I'm going to talk about in the 18 seconds that we have left um, is asymmetric key agreement. So we, we had gotten to this point of uh, when we were doing our max where we were like, well, how do we distribute these shared secrets to everybody and be able to do max? And then we figured out how to use asymmetric uh, cryptography for digital signatures. But then we went back to talking about confidentiality and our symmetric cryptography again requires us to have shared secrets, which has all the same problems that we have with Mac. So we'd like to have some way to be able to do asymmetric cryptography for encryption and decryption. Um, there are a bunch of different systems that you can do use for doing encryption, and some of them directly support encryption and decryption with public and private keys. But the modern way to do this is actually to uh, do something called asymmetric key agreement. Um, you'll also hear this called like a specific instance of this that's the most commonly used one is, one, is something called Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, so basically this problem is how do we uh, bootstrap a shared secret over an insecure channel? Uh, modern example is Diffie-Hellman key agreement. And the very high level view here is the idea is uh, each user in the system has a public key and a private key. Um, and we construct them taking advantage of some special mathematical properties where if I have user A's public key and user B's private key, and I feed them through Diffie-Hellman, and then I have user B's public key and user A's private key. So I have, I've swapped the users and I've swapped the publics and privates here. So each, we have one public key and one private key from each user. And I run both of those through this magical Diffie-Hellman algorithm that I'm not gonna explain, and honestly, I probably couldn't even if I tried. Um, what we get back out is exactly the same secret. And, we can, and what's nice about that is what that means is uh, we can do a key exchange as follows. So I, all of our users have their public keys and their private keys. They can make those public keys public however they want. They can send them back and forth. Uh, if I want to communicate, or if Alice wants to communicate with Bob, Alice can download Bob's private or public key and do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange with her own private key. And Bob can do the same thing with Alice's private key. And then what we've done is this, that magical thing where we have one public key and one private key from each person in the pair, but we've, we've sort of toggled the polarity accordingly. And what that means is at the end, they both have exactly the same secret. Um, and then you should run those things through an additional thing called the key derivation function, which is different than the key derivation function we talked about for passwords because cryptography naming is confusing. Um, and in practice, you should probably like generate these keys ephemerally when you do this. You don't use your, your keys immediately for this, but morally this is, this is the thing that you can do. And it's kind of the magic that makes it all go is just this really sort of simple, beautiful property that if I take one person's public key and one person's private key, and then I swap them, we can get the same secret back out. And based on that, we can figure out how to agree upon a secret value, and then we can do the easy symmetric encryption while only having ever exchanged public information. Um, and I will just show you the slide of what that looks like in cryptography. So this is definitely one where Knackle's one is nicer, um, but I wrote the example in cryptography because I know that one a little bit better. Um, if I can find Knackle box. Oh, ECD, yeah. So, the specific example that I'm doing here is uh, elliptic curve Diffie Hellman. So there's there's different kinds of cryptographic uh, keys. There's elliptic curve and there's RSA and there's different kinds of elliptic curves. Um, we, I'm happy to talk about that more later. But the important thing here is that I've got Albert's private key and I'm just generating a new private key. I'm going to print it. I've got Bryn's private key. I'm generating a new one. I'm going to print it. And then I'm going to run this dot exchange method. So I'm going to take Albert's private key and I'm going to do an ECDH, which is elliptic curve, Divi Hellman, with Bryn's public key. 
And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take Bryn's private key and exchange it with Albert's public key. And then I'm going to run them both through an HKDF, which is that key derivation piece. Um, and if I run all of that, where did I call that file? ECDH. Then the important thing, so Albert's, all these keys actually are is 256-bit integers. Uh, or the private key is an integer. The public key is a point in the xy plane in this weird space of elliptic curves. Um, so they've got these random public and private values. But after they do that ECDH operation, we notice that the shared secret is the same. And the derived secret that comes out of that uh, key derivation function is also the same. <laughs> um, so to review everything we just talked about. Um, Hashing is a super useful tool for guaranteeing data integrity against accidental modification. Um, it doesn't help against an active attacker. If we turn the slideshow off, then people can't read. Uh, message authentication codes use a shared secret to uh, essentially augment a hash to guarantee data integrity and, and authenticity in the face of uh, an attacker. Uh, digital signatures let us use asymmetric signing keys to guarantee data integrity and uh, authenticity without requiring a shared secret. Um, symmetric encryption uses a shared secret again to guarantee confidentiality. Um, and asymmetric encryption lets us use asymmetric keys to derive a shared se session secret, um, which we can then use to do asymmetric encryption to protect our communication. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about some libraries that we talked about here. So in the standard library, we have hashlib and hmac are the, are the things we can use to use hashing and uh, macking. Um, Third-party libraries, the, the two main ones are NACL and cryptography. Um, NACL has sort of a friendlier, bubblier exterior in some ways, but it's harder. It might not interoperate as well with other systems. Um, cryptography does this interesting thing where it splits itself into the recipes layer and the hazmat layer, which is the like... Uh, you must be this tall to ride this ride uh, layer. And there, there's good reasons because a lot of the, the sort of low level, like the stuff that I'm doing in that ECDH thing, you should should definitely be reviewed by someone who knows more about cryptography than me. This is, this is slideware and this is code for helping understanding, not for securing production systems. Um, but the core of it is, is actually sort of fairly understandable, I hope. Uh, in the interest of not overstaying our welcome, I, I think we won't do questions here, but maybe we can do some as we walk down. We can hang out a little okay. bit. Cool. Um, we should make the room, but I want to thank Scott. Uh, what he's talking about is he's willing not only to show and run code, but fix code live, <laughs> live which is very impressive. Um, I want to thank all of you. You're all very impressive to me, too. You've come out here tonight. You're part of this group. You make it happen. Um, maybe you're a sponsor. Maybe you're not. <laughs> um, but thank you. And please join us online for events, um, if you can. Office hour, Monday at noon. Um, the study group is still going on. You can find it at about.bostonpython.com. If you have an idea of something you'd like to tell people, or even if something you'd like to hear from people, Sometimes there are people who are willing to do talks, and they just need to know that someone's interested in the topic. Like if I said decorators, Scott would be like, I'm all over it. So if you've got something you want to hear about, let us know. Find us on Slack. Come and talk to us. I love you all. <laughs>